Okay. Good. Okay, as introduced, my name is Carlos Kuhn, and I'm very glad, thank you the organizer, thank Tommaso for that opportunity to present the work I've been doing at Swinburne in Australia for about one year, and it's an opportunity to come back to Brazil as well to visit my, my orange, correct? And you see that beautiful, beautiful coast. I guess everyone is enjoying and the thing does not work as I expected. Okay. But I don't know why this doesn't work. Okay. Today I'm going to talk about like low lying excitation spectrum. Then I would like to tell you guys I do have like that dispersion diagram at unitarity. That's where my guess is. We everyone now already know what unitarity is. Then when do you have the, the linear dispersion relationship? And then you have the pair breaking. Today, I'm going to be focused in the linear dispersion, and then what you can call the phono modes. That's what they're going to excite. But we have been make works with the long excitations as well, and also you mentioned some pair breaking. I'm going to just mention a tiny bit of this. But the focus is you're going to be that ELON region there. What is not as good as I could expect, I would like to be able to vary much more than that yellow region, but you're going to see I have some experimental limitations. How are we going to do that? First, I'm going to need the lasers to control the atoms in my table laser, and then I'm going to need a vacuum chamber to have all the atoms in, correct? And I need somehow a way to probe the atoms. And that's you're going to be done, my two photon Bragg transitions, what they're going to probe the atoms, and they are going to be inside of that cell. What my joke, because my mobile stopped working to control my computer, it's not going to work. Then I want to make the atoms appear there using my mobile. But that is something weird. Then what I have make you a schematic of my glass cell, when I have then atoms of the species of lithium, as was presented before, also lithium-6, that's a fermion. And I do have in the end of my evaporation process, 3 times 10 of 5 in each species. Then is a degenerate and polar, polarized species. And all the information I'm going to take, what I'm going to talk today, is about using uh, absorption image technique, what's a destructive technique, and that is the map color. Then from this, I'm going to take the, my temperature of the atoms, and also I'm going to get my spectrum using two photon transitions. Then how are we going to do that? First, we need the unitarity. Then we know we have the feedback resonance, when you can control. And I like to show that diagram, because what I'm going to do here is I'm not going to just be at unitarity and at a fixed temperature, but I'm going to change the temperature. And that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to be in the middle there, in that region here, when they're going to scan the temperature and see how that mode changes. We know uh, with the negative weak attractions, we can have very low temperatures, the BCS. I also like to say the BCS is like when the guy and the girl is like in a disco and they are not very brave enough to be together, then they dance together far apart of each other. But then when they become brave, they ask to marry, then they can become BC on the other side. And in the middle, when they have kids, then the attraction becomes very intense. Okay? Uh, then I'm going to be in the middle if when they have like very intense attraction. And as I said, I'm going to use two photon Bragg spectroscopy. What is two photon Bragg spectroscopy? Just a remind. What I'm going to have is I do have like two lasers, counter propagate lasers. When the atom is going to absorb one photon, I'm going to stimulate another photon by simulation emission and then you're going to gain a uh, Rico energy. Okay? Seems like that. Then by conservation of the energy and momentum, we know the direction of the atom goes, and also you know the frequency, what the excitation mode you're going to be. Well, okay, that was fast, but I like to understand a tiny bit with the low excitations. That I think that picture is a tiny bit better, is what, because what we need is a resonance effect. Okay? That's what means is, now, light, you're going to be matter, and matter is going to be light. The, the, the light, you're going to create a pattern, a periodic pattern, what the atoms you're going to scatter from it. 
How is this going to happen? Seems like that. We know if you have two stand wave, we are going to have then a periodic, periodic structure. And as I want that very long wave excitation, then I need a very big space. To be able to have a big space, we know what you just need to do is put I angle in my system, then I'm going to have like my Bragg conditions when they're going to have then a small K or long wave wave excitations. What I want is a resonance effect because I want the phonon. Then that means that my stand waves not are not going to be stand waves. They're going to be a moving stand wave because they're going to change the frequency between the two lasers, the omega 1, omega 2 before, if you remember on this slide. And then that's still going to be the velocity of our mode we are going to excite. Good. But as mentioned before here, I also is interested in your local properties. Then how I'm going to do this with my system? I'm going to focus my beam in the middle of the cloud. Then my grating, you're going to be just in the middle. And this you're going to make, say you're going to have a near uniform density, as good as possible. And this you're going to set then the scale of my system when I can get my firm energy. And then everything is going to be normalized by that firm energy. Because remember in that unitarity, at unitarity I can I can have all the energy, all the thermodynamic properties to be a function of density and temperature. And then those are the things that are going to be very in this work. And those are the bracket conditions, what we already understand very fast how to do it. I'm going very fast this because it's all boring, everyone here already knows these things. The results, what is going to be surprising, is nice. First, I'm going to just mention the system works very nice, also to scan for the transition in that rich phase diagram I just passed, where we could measure the goldstone mode when in the BSC side of the flashback. And when you're going to change my magnet field, going to the BCS side, we can go to the single particle excitation. Okay? We break the pair. And today, I'm going to be focused at unitarity here, yeah? when then we also could measure the pairing gap at unitarity and what should be the speed of the sound or speed of the mode. I'm going to see it's a bit hard to detect in the moment what the speed. Because I would like to, to point out the work I'm going to present today, I still do not understand fully. I'm trying to understand. And that's going to be very challenging and fun as well. Then I said I'm going to use clouds like that to be able to get all my information from. What I'm going to do is I'm going to push my Bragg system for 1.2 milliseconds. It's that time is like defined by the trap frequency limitation in the angle I can go to be able to consider the, fre the trap frequency of my excitation mode. Okay, that's why I use that time. Then I let this expand for 4 milliseconds. And what I do have is a, a picture there. And I need to discover how many atoms from the middle here I excited, right? Because you remember I show I got like a recoil velocity the resonance. Then they're gonna have a displacement of the center of the mass. And to be able to do that, it's clear if I use the technique of the differential optical depth, where then I just get a, when I do have a, no difference in frequency as my base, and then I can subtract all the other pictures as that, normalizing for for that base. And we can see the blue region are the holes where the atoms used to be, and the red ones are the ones who get kicked. And then they'll tell us, like, get moved forwards. And this happens just around of the resonance, when they have like, the excitation of that mode. Okay? And if I be able to get something to be able to plot, uh, what I need to know is to know then how much I, my center of mass is displaced from. Then what do you do? We use the wings of the cloud to set our reference, and then the middle we can integrate, and you can get our signal. Hmm? That you can see in that plot here, then the integration signal from the middle, and that is the reference, the center of the mass using the two wings of the, the cloud, and that's the pixel, and each color is for each one of those different frequencies. As you can see also, there is a function of a frequency shift and what is very interesting is the depend of the temperature, and that's what we're going to see very soon. But first, I want to show why I say spectrum, 
because then we can get the spectrum for using for one of those each frequency. Each one of those become one of those points, and then you get your spectrum, what's just the displacement of the center of mass. But then, to be able to understand something, I need to fit. And I need to know what it is, what physics I can extract from that. To be able to do that, I come up with the, I remember the, the harmonic dump, the har drive harmonic oscillator, what I can think just in you know, one mode excitation, because I can see just one mode excitation. Then I want to know how much energy my system absorbs. That's what uh, I thought. By getting then the rate of the absorption of the energy, is just four times the velocity of the system, I can get then the rate of the absorption, what is going to give me then a uh, mapping direct to my momentum in the cloud, because momentum then you're going to be just the, he the rate times the how much of momentum I transfer for each of the particles in the excited state, times the duration of my pulse, and times the time of the fly. Then this you're going to give me the displ displacement of the center of the mass. And then, was I interested in the linear dispersion regime? What is this happen is, I just need to change my mode in that expression there by the value of what will be the linear regime. And as I mentioned something with a density perturbation, I my first guess is this is a, a sound wave. Because you know sound waves is a density perturbation. And that's why I put that S there. But it's okay, now I have something I can fit my data, but I want to know what causes the diff, the, the width of my, my spectrum. Because I do have like a fitting parameter and I do have a width view with the dump harmonic oscillator, I have no idea what it is. To be able to do that, I can think in two only possibles, hydrodynamic or collisionless. Hydrodynamic, to make clear, is the phonon, the frequency of the phonon have to be much smaller than the collision of frequency of those, the, the phonon not sure, it's, it's the, the mode, right? In the collisionless is, is much bigger. What it means is the hydrodynamic, I just have to have collisions enough to be able to locally thermalize the system. If I locally thermalize the system, I can use Newton's law or the hydrodynamic equations. Okay? Then the dump, you're gonna, we're gonna be possible to describe use the Landau to fluid hydrodynamic, is that you'll be like, only. in the collisionless, we have a few, few possible possibilities to cause my delays. Mm -hmm. And then that's what to make the job very hard because I have to discover, discover which one of those are what is causing that. But well, of course, I said I am at unitarity. Then a lot of collisions, we can think. The system you have to be hydrodynamic. And that was my first guess. Then I went for all the books of the old papers of hydrodynamic, it was very fun. And they said, like, the speed of soda have to be this. In a normal hydrodynamic, I am having a density fluctuation, then what I need to measure is the density density response function. And then, but what they take is the displacement of the center of the mass. It's easy, because the momentum, you will be proportional to the imaginary part of the density density response function, the density correlation function. Line. And then if you want to have the momentum, I already show how I convert momentum to the displacement of the center of the mass. Right? Then, okay, that should give me the expression. Then what I'm going to do is, let's learn a bit about two fluid hydrodynamic equations, because I have the phones, the excitations, what will be my normal fluid, and I have my superfluid in the unitarity. And I do have the first equation, what is just conservation of mass. The second one I like to say, like in Newton's law, it's just like all the tensors that make the, the equilibrium rich. I hit and then hit it back me. Then it's viscosity, thermal conductivity, all those things. That one, because I have any temperature, then I do have like uh, a temperature wave as well, when you're gonna see it's linked to the second sound. And I have the velocity of the sound as well, is the gradient of the phase, because the earth parameter is not invariant to Galeon transform. Okay, then you can solve all those four equations, and you get an equation like that, very beautiful, and you can see clearly you have two modes, C1 and C2. Okay. But I am at unitarity. 
Then anti neutrality if you manipulate those equations, you can expand everything in terms of that quantity. What that velocity, honestly, I do not understand very well, which is. It's up here there, it's like it's a coupling velocity between the two ones. Inside here, I have the Landau plaque check term. What is very small, for he, very small for helium, but not very small for unitary fermion. But that quantity here is still very small. You can use the equation of states of MIT to be able to calculate the heat capacity, uh, uh, constant pressure, and the heat capacity of volume pressure. Then you're going to see that quantity here is very small. Then what you can decoupling the first sound for the second sound. The second sound, everyone knows, gives you the ratio between the superfluid, superfluid and the normal fluid portion. And the first sound then becomes just the adiabatic velocity. That equation I just give you my guess in the beginning. Okay? Then what it means is my spectrum should be something like that. What is very look like the same equation you get if you just use the dumped harmonic oscillator. It's exactly the same. Then it means, okay, good. I can, I can, I can just plot my data the anyway. If I plot my data, you can see the equations are that the same. I'm gonna be able to extrapolate what is the dump. What I don't know what the reasons of the dump yet it is, but I am guessing now is in the hydrodynamic, and I can get the value of the main resonance. What you're gonna give me the speed of the sound, right? And of course, I am an experimentalist. Then this is. No, not you're going to be just equal the equation. You have to take in account our fine size of the pulse and fine time of the pulse. Then this gives you an instrumental broadening of my Bragg system about 1.25 kilohertz. Then I have to convolve that to that equation there. When I convolve this to the equation, I get those solid lines who fit my spectra. What I think is a very good agreement. I was very happy when this happened. I, I understand my data. But then we can see I change by function of temperature, and we can see already there is a very big jump between below TC and above TC. Mm -hmm. But let's then now to study the, the first sound. Let's get like the middle of that, uh, that curve, that, uh, that Lorentzian kind, it's a Voigt profile, it's a Lorentzian with a Gaussian profile, give you a Voigt. Then if you get that value in the middle there, you can get those points here, then you have like the first sound normalized with the velocity of Fermi velocity, and you have here as yes, function of temperature. And you say, okay, if that is my approximation, I'm saying I can approximate first sound with the velocity diabetic, I can use then MIT, giving me the equation of state for the data, and I just make a simple derivation. As experimentalists, like, you can do derivations. Then you, you get the, the red line. The, 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 no, but you cannot say colors. You can get the green line, right? Look like a very good agreement. Sadly, I do have uh, a big error bars. The, the spectrum is very hard to get. Each one to those points is eight hours of data. And then in the end, the way it's too noisy, you have to throw away, take another day, eight hours of data, but it's worth. As you can see, it's a good agreement. And here, as I mentioned before, I cannot vary my K and KF very much because my angle is fixed in the experiment. I cannot change my angle. Then the only way I am varying that is by changing the aspect rate of my cloud. Then what I change is not the K, I change my KF. What don't look like very nice there, the KF. Then I have like a very small range to change, but I also already look like it's a linear. Then it's still like I'm still in the phone regime if I try to compare with my diagram I showed before. And that's like it was like that yellow region in that diagram I was mentioned before. But then we are, our guess is that is the hydrodynamic regime. Then the hydrodynamic we know like the width, the full width half maximum should be something function of uh, the shear viscosity and the thermal conductivity at unitarity. Okay? And also should it go with the K square, what is, you see I don't have much data in K, then I could not just fit to be able to check how much is going. Only oh, five minutes, okay. But the interesting thing is that the width you take from each spectrum of temperature, you can see that it's like a jump when you reach the TC. Very nice jump there, you can detect something is going on there. I do have five minutes. Then we start to think, okay, 
Maybe there is something different, because we will not predict that jump here. That is, what, is what could be is, to be able to be fully hydrodynamic requirement, my moment of the excitation has to be also very small. And they have to be actually very long wave. Like in that diagram I show, you have to be very in the, when you have like that diagram there, and you have here in the continuum, the vibrate, you have to be like here. I am here. Right? And that's what maybe is what is causing my, my problem, but they're going to say, I'm going to ignore that. And I'm also going to try to extrapolate the shear viscosity by doing, pretend my lithium is helium and I could just consider the last term. And then by my surprise is for higher than, than TC, I actually don't, it's not so bad if I'm going to compare with my data, which the data by Thomas and Chef when they try measure the shear viscosity. And the Behold, TC is shuffle when they just like recalculate the measurements of uh, Thomas. Be below TC, yes, I agree. It's not very good. Not, not, agree. not good at all. Then, of course, I do have to look for different reasons. And then I have like you know, all those, those lines to check, which is which kind of Landau and the root name, Libby, I cannot say so many names, is what is causing that dump. Then I need some help. I started contact a few weeks ago, people doing the theory to help modeling the system. Then they are using a mean field in the BCS size, using a quasi random phase approximation. They can get like a good, uh, a similar behave in the dumping uh, below TC. Of course, that theory is not going to work above TC because it's not, there is no superfluid anymore to work. And you are trying to see if he, above that, we have like a, a hydrodynamic or something like that. And below, we have a collisionless regime. Yes, and surprise, seems I have a collisionless in, in unitarity. It's possible, right? The another interesting thing we saw as well is like the, the, the amplitude of the, the, the mode also changed very drastically in the slope then. In the width, I have a discontinuity directly, and in the amplitude, I have a discontinuity in the first derivative. You can see I have two very strong slopes, and then should cause a good way to determine like, the, the critical temperature. All have very preliminary results, and trying to understand everything. Another note, very interesting is, remember those images I showed you guys before? Yes. This is below TC. All my images look like that. My hole displaced from the center as well. Above, see? No. My hole is becoming the, still in the center. Then when I saw this, I think, okay, look like there and have just a single excitation, like I just breaking pair and kicking some atoms from. But it still works with hydrodynamic, then it should be a not single part, it should be a mold. Then I cannot, I do not understand. But here I can detect that is a, a wave look like perturbation going on. Like, it's not just like a single particle excitation and kicking from the cloud, but I am having like a drag with together and everything is moving together. And then that is, I is still trying to understand how can I extrapolate more information from this to be able to understand which dumping is and which kind of sound uh, we, are, we are measuring. And of course, I'm not working alone. That's Chris Veil. My, my boss, the taller one. And then this is the student who just joined the group. He's an undergraduate, he's going to be honest next time. Then I have Sasha, the one who started working at the machine. And then I do have, uh, we have Paul and Ivan, all, all the three as a postdoc. The two ones is working in the next stage, what is going for 2D. And me, who will start soon work with the machine and taking all the data and trying to explain. And that's are the theories collaboration you are now working with to try to understand those data. Yo and Jamie and Prof Professor Hui from Swinburne, who we are having a lot of good discussions to be able to understand. And with that in the meantime, I can just say what you would like to understand is seems low-lying excitations is a very good tool to be able to understand the, 
the spectrum, like the so, sorry, too bright photon to be able to understand the spectrum. And what you're going to do after, we are going to investigate the same thing into these systems. Going to, to try to do some connection with the condensate matter and to understand transport properties, superfluidities, and else. And also, we will try to change our, our trap to be able to try to see if we can go with a lower moment to be able to actually reach the hydrodynamic even, even for the cold clouds. And with that, I'm going to say thank you. Thank you very much. Questions? Did you consider the Belyayev damping? No, I did not. That I, 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 I,